Hi, Zion friends. I'm Pastor Greg, and I'm coming with to you this evening with a Bible study from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Over the last few weeks since this COVID-19 experience has come upon us, for some reason, the Lord has led me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. So I prepared a Bible study for us this evening, and the, the name of the study is Confidence in This Crisis. And the crisis that we're in, obviously, is COVID-19. But as we know, there's a lot of crisis that come into our world, into our lives. So now today, at this time, we're co concentrating on COVID-19. But remember, it could be any crisis that comes into our lives. So let me lead off by sharing a story with you. A bricklayer in, uh, wrote a letter to his boss, and he wrote this letter explaining why he needed to take some time off to have some sick leave. And he wrote to his boss, I arrived at the job after the storm, and I checked the building out, and I saw that the top of the building needed repair, so I rigged a hoist and a boom. I attached the rope to the barrel and pulled the bricks up to the top. And when I pulled the barrel to the top, I secured the rope at the bottom. And after repairing the rooftop of the building on top, I went back to uh, fill the barrel with the leftover bricks. And then I went down to the ground and released the rope to lower the bricks. And the barrel was heavier than I thought. And it jerked me right off the ground. And I decided to hang on. But halfway up, I met the barrel coming down, receiving a blow to my shoulder. But I hung on and I went to the top where I hit my head on the boom and I caught my fingers on the rope in the pulley. And in the meantime, the barrel hit the ground and it burst wide open, throwing those bricks all over the ground. This made the barrel lighter than me and I started down at high speed towards the ground. But halfway down, the barrel met me on the way up and I received a blow to my shins. Well, I continued down after the blow and fell right into the pile of bricks. I got cuts, I got bruises, he writes. And at this time, I must have lost consciousness because I let go of the rope. And of course, the barrel came down and hit me on the head. So I respectfully request sick leave. Have you ever had a day like that? Some of you are thinking, a day like that? That describes the last few weeks for me and my family, if not physically, at least emotionally. It just seems to be one thing after another until I'm left feeling battered. This coronavirus and the resulting COVID-19 are changing every aspect of our life. If you're like many, you are probably panicking a little bit right now. It feels like practically overnight things went from bad to dangerous feeling off kilter, not quite sure how to move forward because we don't know where forward is. And it seems like people are naturally anxious these days. And so when it seems like the madness of the world is on the increase, you know, worry and fear and stress, anxiety, doubt, they also increase dramatically. And the pit that people normally have in their stomach, you know, and that pressure in our heads, it's grown as well. So whether our trials are of the crisis sort or whether they are the more steady, relentless pressures that just wear away at our resistance, you see, we've got them all. And while most of us know that we should pray more and trust in God more, for some reason, we don't do it. In fact, let me make a confession that I myself, I struggle with the question, why don't I pray as I ought? And the answer is this, I think, and it's very, fairly simple. See, I don't pray as I ought because I'm self-sufficient. The Bible calls that pride, P-R-I-D-E. Remember from a message a while ago, people realize I did everything, pride? And you see, my pride makes me then think erroneously that I can handle everything on my own with just a little help from God now and then. So I rely mostly on myself and a little bit on God. So God graciously brings these trials to show me my great need so that I'll look to my great God in prayer and repentance and trust Him to work on my behalf. And this story of Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1-30 to 30 shows us how to have confidence in a crisis. Not confidence in ourselves, you know, the American way, but confidence in God. 
And Jehoshaphat had a character flaw. I need to share that with you as well. He made wrongful alliances with the godless King Ahab. But no, he was also a man who followed the Lord and brought spiritual reform to the nation of Israel. If you don't have a Bible, you should pause right now the video and go get one. Now, Jehoshaphat was shaken one morning. Why? Because his intelligence resources came running in with some horrifying news. And that news is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. It reads, After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and some of the other Munites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It's already in Hazan Tamar. See, what this meant is that the enemy coalition was about 15 miles south of Jerusalem. They were on the western shore of the Dead Sea. And what this meant is that Jehoshaphat's life and his entire kingdom were on the brink of extinction. Talk about a reason to panic, right? So what did he do? What would you do if you heard you had some threatening news that affected your future or, or maybe your life or should I say, what are you doing now during this virus crisis? See, I want to show you that this godly king did the right thing. He called a national prayer meeting. He repented and then encouraged the people to trust in God in the face of this overwhelming crisis. And they did it. And they literally won the war by praying alone, without swinging or yielding a single sword. Their story teaches you and I, us today, that we can be confident in a time of crisis if we let our great need drive us to prayer, drive us to repentance, drive us to faith in our great God. So in chapter 20, verse 1 to 4 of our uh, 1 to 30 text, we see their great need. And then in ch uh, chapter 20, verse 5 to 13, Jehoshaphat's prayer reveals their great God. And then in chapter 20, verse 14 to 30, we see their faith in their great God and the victory that he brought about. So the first point is, is a recognition of our great need should drive us to prayer. So now let me read chapter 20, verse 1 to 4, and read along with me silently. After this, the Moabites and the Ammonites with some of the Menunites came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already at Hazazan Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. That's obvious to any believer, of course, that we should be driven to prayer. But just because it's obvious, it doesn't make it automatic. So a recognition of our great need doesn't automatically drive us to prayer. So what I'm saying in this text, it's easy for us to read this account and miss what a great thing it was for Jehoshaphat to call this nation to prayer and repentance over this crisis. Put yourself in his place. It would have been very human to panic. When he heard the news of this coalition of armies within his borders, he could have understood if, we, if he would have yelled out at the top of his lungs, Call all the generals together! Get the army mobilized immediately! We only have seconds to, to spare! And then as soon as the troops are mustered up and gathered together, if there's time for prayer, we'd have a quick word of prayer. But turning his attention to seek the Lord and calling the nation to prayer, repentance, and fasting, you see, was not automatic. Not only could Jehoshaphat reacted with panic, he could have also had a twinge of anger at God. He just has instituted a number of reforms to bring the nation back to the Lord. In chapter 20, verse 1, the, the text states, Now it came about after this. Well, after what? Well, after his reforms... So let's read now 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 4 to 11. Jehoshaphat lived in Jerusalem, and he went out again among the people from Beersheba to the hill country of Ephraim, and turned, back, turned them back to the Lord, the God of their fathers. He anointed judges in the land, in each of the fortified cities of Judah. He told them, 
Consider carefully what you do, because you are not judging for man, but for the Lord. Who is this with... Who is with you whenever you give a verdict? Now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Judge carefully, for with the Lord our God there is no injustice or partiality or bribery. In Jerusalem also, Jehoshaphat appointed some of the Levites, priests, and heads of the Israelite families to administer the law of the Lord and to settle disputes. And they lived in Jerusalem. He gave them these decrees. You must serve faithfully and wholeheartedly in the fear of the Lord. In every case that comes before you from your fellow countrymen who live in the cities, whether bloodshed or other concerns of the law, commands, decrees, or ordinance, you are to warn them not to sin against the Lord. Otherwise his wrath will come on you and your brothers. Do this and you will not sin. Amorah the chief priest will be over you in any matter concerning the Lord. And Zebediah, son of Ishmael, the leader of the tribe of Judah, will be over you in any matter concerning the king. And the Levites will serve as officials before you. Act with courage, and may the Lord be with those who do well. See, it would have been easy for Josephat to have said, What kind of deal is this, God? Right? I tried to bring the nation back to you. I taught them to put away their idols, to follow you because you're worthy of their trust. And now you're facing, bringing these coalition of armies to face annihilation at the hands of these pagans. See if I follow you again. And a lot of people in the world today, in our life today, have the same thing happening to them. They say they've tried to follow God, and then they get hit with difficulties and trials, and they get angry, maybe complain. This isn't fair, God. Right? I was trying to follow you and do your will, and then I get hit with this trouble. Well, my pagan neighbor gets everything. So they pout and maybe even feel sorry for themselves. But what we should be doing is humbly submitting to God in prayer and repentance. And, and instead of doing that, they lash out at God in anger. But look at Jehoshaphat. See, he's our example here. He didn't do that. He, uh, what he did was not automatic. It's not automatic in a crisis. He prayed. He repented. He humbled himself before God. So another reaction that Jehoshaphat could have had was to trust in his army or to trust in worldly things. Chapter 17, verse 12 to 19 tells us about this organization and the mighty forces that were at his hands. So let's stop there and read this from chapter 17. Jehoshaphat became more and more powerful. He built forts and store cities in Judah and had large supplies in the towns of Judah. He also kept experienced fighting men in Jerusalem. Their enrollment by families was as follows. From Judah, 1,000. Uh, Adna, the commander, with 300,000 fighting men. Jehonan, the commander, with 280,000. Amaziah, who uh, had 200,000. Benjamin, 200,000. Jehozabad, 180,000 men armed for battle. These were the men who served the king, besides those he stationed in the fortified cities, throughout Judah. So, it tells here about the organization and the might of his forces. See, he was equipped for war. It would have been easy for him to think, this is sort of the thing we're prepared for, everyone. Call out the army. Let's get them going. But Jehoshaphat, rather than trusting in his army or the things of this world, right, he admits his lack of strength. He calls on God as his only help in this crisis. He put prayer first. He realized that he could... Uh, do things after he had prayed, but he couldn't do anything worthwhile before he prayed. Prayer was the strongest weapon. So he resisted the temptation to panic. He resisted the temptation to get angry at God. And he resisted the temptation to trust his army or the things of this world. He recognized his great need, so he prayed and he repented. You say, well, that's what I want to do during this time of fear and anxiety and doubt and isolation. But really, to understand this story, we have to see that Jehoshaphat's call was a humiliating thing for him to do. A recognition of our great need then requires to humble ourselves before God and others. And here, Jehoshaphat, he was the king of Judah, right? And in the ancient Near East, kings were a proud lot. They had an, a, a, a big image to maintain. Leaders have to be tough. They have to be inspired. 
They have to show forth confidence in their leadership. What kind of leader admits in the front of his people, I'm scared? Folks, because we're helpless against this enemy, I'm scared. That's not good politics, is it? But that's what Jehoshaphat did. He admitted his fear. He called the national prayer meeting. He repented and then prayed in front of everyone about how helpless he was. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them, those coalition of forces coming for us? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. And here's my favorite part. We do not know what to do but our eyes are upon you. See, you and I, we join Jehoshaphat and acknowledge God to God that we are powerless, that we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, O oh God. God is our confidence in this virus crisis and in every crisis that may enter our lives. Surely it would have been better politically to Jehoshaphat to pray in private and then get up in front of the people and say, we've got a little problem here, folks. But our side is strong. Our troops are going to wipe them out. So why don't you pray a little for us as we go out and defend our nation against these intruders. But you see, Jehoshaphat wasn't worried about politics. He wasn't worried about his public image. He just knew that he was in deep trouble if God didn't answer. And so he openly admitted his weakness and called upon the Lord. But once our need drives us to God in prayer, we repent, and then we need to understand how to pray. So Jehoshaphat's prayer gives us some important instruction on how to seek God in prayer. It's a recognition of how great God is as he directs our prayers. There are two things here for us to see. Uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 5 to 13 is what I'd like to read right now, this prayer. And we're re I'm reading now. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard and said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the powers of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They have lived in it and have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. But now there are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance? O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. In our prayers, we should only seek answers, should not only seek answers to our problems, but we should seek God himself. Note on verse 3 of our text, Jehoshaphat, he turned his attention. He, he set his face. He was determined to seek the Lord. And then in verse 4, it states that the people not only sought, to, to help, uh, sought help from the Lord, but see, they sought the Lord himself. And this was nothing new for Jehoshaphat. Earlier in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 4, Jehoshaphat's described as a king who seeks the God of his father. And the Hebrew word seek in that verse means literally to trample underfoot. So get this, he's beating a path to God because he was going to him so frequently. It's like the trail in a grass. It's significant that in Jehoshaphat's prayer, the first four verses, verses 6 through 9, focus on God himself, focuses on his attributes. And then finally, in the last three verses, 10, 11, and 12, he mentions the problem. But even in mentioning the problem Jehoshaphat, uh, that Jehoshaphat has, God is prominent. I wonder if we were facing imminent annihilation, would we be so God-centered? So let me ask, how are we doing in this COVID-19 crisis? 
from our state of health to our state of economy at all levels. In a crisis, if we pray at all, what do we usually pray? God, get me out of here. I want relief and I want it now. But let me say that in so praying this way, we miss some crucial items. In a crisis, we aren't supposed to run and get God off the shelf and then put him back on the shelf for the next crisis. The trials and crisis should cause us to seek God himself because he himself is what you and I need as his people. God is our sufficiency, our very life. If we have God and cling to him, then even if we aren't delivered from our crisis, we can go through it. Even through the loss of a child, even through the loss of possessions as Job went through. Because as is said here of Abraham in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, the living God is our friend. And if we turn to God as our only refuge and strength, He gets the glory. We should come away not just having presented our request to God, but also knowing God better, who Himself is our refuge, who Himself is our strength in times of trouble. So in our prayers, we should seek God as revealed in His Word. And notice how Jehoshaphat's prayer is steeped in Scripture. He starts at 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 6, reciting God's attributes. You are the God of our fathers, right? He's, he's implying that you took care of them, now take care of us. You are the God of the heavens and the ruler over all the kingdoms of the nations, including those that are threatening to wipe us out right now. And you are so powerful, you are so mighty that no one can stand against you. So why is he telling God all this? Certainly not for God's information, right? It was to rehearse in his own mind and the people's minds the greatness of God so they could trust in him. And then next he recites God's actions in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7. It reads, O our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to your for uh, give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. See, he reminds, he reminds God of his agreement to hear the prayers of his people when they cry to him in their distress. Then Jehoshaphat mentions the problem. The problem, uh, is, he, he reminds God that it stems from the fact that Israel obeyed him by not wiping out the people that are coming down now to invade the land. That's chapter 20, verse 11, 10, and 11. See, they're about to be driven out of Israel, not of their possession, but, but of God's possession. So finally, he calls attention to God's ability to deal with the problem in contrast to Israel's inability. Chapter 20, verse 12. That's a great prayer because it's saturated with God's Word. It focuses on God as He is revealed in His Word. And, and if we fill our prayers with the greatness of our problems, see, we're going to shrink back in faith. But if we fill our prayers with the greatness of God and, and how He has worked down through history, we'll build and stimulate our faith. He will zero us in by the power of the Holy Spirit right to the cross of Jesus Christ for our redemption, and right to the empty tomb where Jesus defeated sin, death, and the power of the devil, and leads us to eternal life, increasing our joy, increasing our trust, lifting us up into his joy and trust, just like wind beneath an eagle's wings. God delights to answer believing prayers where we put our finger on the promises and trust in his word and ask him to make it so in our case. So, one was a recognition of our great need should drive us to prayer. And then the second main point is a recognition of our great God should direct our prayers. And then finally, reliance on our great God should follow our prayers. And that is verses 14 to 30. And you can read that all on your own. We'll read a few as we go through the study here. But as, as the nation was gathered at the temple in prayer, the Spirit of God came upon a prophet in the assembly, in chapter 20, verse 14, who then encouraged them not to fear. He assured them that God would undertake for them in this battle without their fighting at all. Let's pause here and look at chapter 20, verse 15 to 17. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, this is the prophet speaking, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you, 
Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Zis, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. When they heard this word through the prophet, they all fell down. They all worshiped, and when they stood up, they sang loud praises. Let's pause and look at verses 18 and 19. Jehoshaphat bowed with his face to the ground, and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some of the Levites from the Kothahites and the Korhites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with very loud voice. By the way, we further see Jehoshaphat's humility here. Don't miss it. If he had been proud, he would have said, Hey, wait a minute, I'm the king. I called this prayer meeting to order. Who does this prophet think he is giving a message from God? God gives the messages through me. But see, he didn't do that. He was willing to submit to God's word through this other man. Then based on the prophet's word from God, the people got up the next morning. They marched out to the battlefield, led by a choir singing praises of all things. Let's pause. Look at verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. And then God caused the enemy armies to turn against each other so that all, of Israel, all Israel had to do was collect the spoil and celebrate the victory. So two thoughts here. Reliance on God means being obedient to his word. See, the promise given through the prophet in chapter 20, verse 15 to 17 was one thing, okay? But believing and acting on it was another. Think about these singers as they were staking their very lives on the truthfulness of the word of God. They were going to do a crazy thing, weren't they? They were going to march unarmed in front of the army, singing praises to God against a powerful enemy that was armed to the teeth. And as they went out, this seemingly crazy mission, Jehoshaphat encouraged the people by saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 20, verse 20, Put your trust in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Put your trust in His prophets, that is, in His word, and succeed. And their trust was put into shoe leather, if you will, and that they kept on marching. And this deliverance, dear friends, is a picture of our salvation. In salvation, you and I can't do anything. God does it all. Chapter 20, verse 17. Stand and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. Even faith is a gift of God so that we cannot boast. Yet at the same time, our faith in God's promise, which lays hold of His salvation, is this not some kind of an intellectual assent where we say, I believe, but don't act on it. Let me tell you, saving faith is always obedient faith. Just as these singers' faith was demonstrated by their marching out to battle, armed only with songs of praise, so genuine faith in Christ as Savior will be demonstrated in a life of joyful obedience to His Word. Faith that says, I don't know what to do, so I'll keep my eyes on you, O Lord Jesus Christ, the only name that saves. And so the second and final Reliance on God is always rewarded by God, it seems. He never fails those who trust in Him. He never fails those who obey His Word. And that's not to say that He delivers everyone who trusts, him from suffer, or trusts in Him from suffering or even death. That doesn't happen all the time for those who believe. There are many who have trusted in God and lost their heads. Let's pause and look at Hebrews chapter 11, please. Verses 36 to 40. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36 to 40. It reads, Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went into sheepskin and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. 
The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This earthly life isn't the final chapter, dear friends. All who suffer loss for in Jesus will be richly rewarded in heaven. Just as Israel was enriched literally by the spoils of the victory, so we also will be enriched spiritually through our trials if we recognize our great need, if we pray to our great God and repent and rely on Him alone and not on human schemes and support. There's a popular t-shirt uh, uh, that I that I like. It's about baseball. I miss baseball greatly. So uh, the t-shirt reads, it's bottom of the ninth, down by three runs, bases loaded, two outs, full count, no fear. For me, that shirt is promoting the American folk virtue, self-confidence and crisis. Pride, P-R-I-D-E, people realize I did everything. But Christians should join Jehoshaphat, you and I, in rejecting all of the self-confidence and acknowledging that, oh God, we're powerless and we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. You see, God is our confidence in the crisis. The crisis of COVID-19, the crisis of cancer, the flu, stroke, heart attack, car accident, and death, or whatever else that enters our lives as God's people. Carrie Ten Boom, who is the author of The Hiding Place and the survivor of the German concentration camps, used to have people come up to her all the time and say, Corey, my, what great faith you have. And she would smile and humbly reply, No, it's what a great God I have. We can be confident in a time of crisis if we let our need drive us to prayer, if we are in a state of repentance and are, have faith in our great and merciful God. Oh God, we don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you, and our confidence is in you. I hope this Bible study gives you an air of confidence in this time of crisis. God bless you.